Chapter 8, Patient Assessment. As we go through this, I want you to think about this as its entire module. Uh, there's nothing else to it. It's just patient assessment, and a big part of this has to do with finding life-threatening problems with your patient and being able to stabilize those. So that's your key um, function in this, in this module. Uh, it comp is comprised of scene size up, which includes scene safety. Goes back to that, who's the most important person on the ambulance, scene safety. And you have to be diligent with this. When you get the call, when you receive the call, if it's you know a shooting, you have to think about it as a person that shot them still on scene. And then all the way through, think about um, watching out for your own safety. Scene management. And you have to remember, you're in charge of the scene. If you're not in charge of the scene, somebody better be. But there needs to be one person in charge of that scene, and you set the standards. It may be, hey, can we turn off the television? It's kind of loud. I can't assess you. I can't hear you. And um, you set the scene. We think about our standard precautions. Gloves on every call, sometimes a mask, sometimes goggles, sometimes that gown. It's going to start with a primary assessment. Your primary assessment is your AVPU ABCs. So level of consciousness we look at, are they awake? Are they responsive to verbal, painful, or are they completely unresponsive? And then your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. We're gonna identify life threats and treat those as we go. We're gonna get a history from all of our patients. We do that with an acronym called the SAMPLE HISTORY, S-A-M-P-L-E. And uh, that helps us determine more information about that chief complaint. We're gonna look at the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness if it was medical, and then associated signs and symptoms. On the secondary assessment, we're gonna do a rapid trauma assessment um, and then a plan of action. And that plan of action is going to include what we're gonna do for the patient uh, for their pain as well as management of vital signs. We're gonna do reassessment and learn when and how to do that. So oftentimes EMRs are the first trained people at the emergency scene. So you gather a lot of information that, uh, uh, and we're all about sharing. You wanna be able to share that information back. We're not keeping of information. So you're gonna do these in this order. Scene size up, primary assessment, secondary assessment, which includes their medical history, and then that reassessment for however long you have that patient. Uh, so the skills and knowledge in here are trying to find out what the problem is and then being able to manage it. We like to work in a, in a sequence. Now, if you do the fill in the blank activity, it's gonna be very specific on step by step and we call it parrot phrases. I have BSI is the scene safe. What's the mechanism of injury? How many patients do I have? Do I need additional help? And I wanna consider C-spine. If you do these steps in sequence, it follows right along with National Registry. Now, after you've been doing this for a few years, I don't expect you to pull up on a scene in your emergency vehicle and hop out and say, I have BSI, is the scene safe? How many patients do I, yeah. You don't really do that, but if you do it in a sequential order, then it gives you um, a method to not have omissions. And when you have omissions, that's when you're going to um, have things that affect your patient care. So starting out with scene size up, it's a general overview of the incident surrounding. So it begins with dispatch. The location, maybe it's a very um, a remote area, maybe if it's a very busy highway, and you have to think about what do I need to take? What specialized equipment or specialized service do I need to take? The type of the incident, the number of people. So looking, if, if you are in a transport vehicle, how many people can you transport if they're on backboards? Probably only two. So you know how many, how many uh, ambulances to send or what other resources that you can at the, at the time. So as you're going to the call, you want to think about factors that can affect your actions. Uh, time of day. Maybe it's dusk and you, you have an hour of daylight and then you're going to need more resources to light up that area if it takes longer than that. Uh, day of the week. Is it a busy uh, weekday where uh, you know, people are coming and going to work or is it a busy weekend where people are out um, you know, driving uh, for holiday or whatever, and then weather conditions. Uh, you have to think about too hot, too cold, icy, windy, rain, flooding, all of these things help you prepare for that. Your two-way radio is your lifeline. It's your lifeline to give information and to receive information. So talking the first step, scene safe. Is the scene safe? We want to park our vehicle so that we don't obstruct anything, but at the same time we protect ourselves. I love pumpers. You know, I don't know what they weigh, 90,000 pounds or whatever, and they block traffic and they ensure your safety. But whether, whatever ambulance or emergency vehicle that you drive in, we want to park it so that we can get equipment off of the ambulance really quick and get the patient to the ambulance really quick. 
we want to look for visible hazards. If it's a crash or a crime scene, certain things are going to come to mind that, that you know, there could be jagged metal, there could be uh, evidence that you don't want to move, but at the same time being able to take care of the patient. Uh, look at broken poles, utility poles that are broken. You've got electrical wires uh, that are under tension that could snap at any time. Uh, traffic, smil spilled gasoline or other fluids from under the ambulance. Unstable surfaces, so you, especially in a vehicle, you want to walk around it first and make sure it's stable before you access it. Uh, weather in crowds. Crowds can be a problem. You have a big family event and uh, you know somebody goes unresponsive and maybe you look like you're moving too slow. They can all start yelling at you and, and you know become volatile so it's, that could be an unsafe situation. Other hazards. Electricity uh, can always be a factor. Think about water as being a con good conductor. So you want to be diligent and look around at all these hazards all the time. If you smell something that doesn't smell right, get out. Stay upwind, uphill, if the scene is unsafe, you keep everybody out, you keep yourself away uh, until those trained teams arrive. Look at the mechanism of injury. It tells you in trauma what happened. Was it a fall? Was it a motor vehicle crash? If it was, was it high speed? Was it a rollover? Was it a fender bender? Was it a rear end? All that information should be in your run report. All that information needs to be conveyed to the receiving hospital because this is the information that nobody gets to see but you. You get to see all of this and you have to report it. Uh, where they were sitting at in the car, whether or not they were wearing their seat belt, whether or not they had airbags, whether or not they were ejected, how you found them. That's a mechanism of injury. And you want to also consider the nature of illness if it's medical. They complain of chest pain or a respiratory problem, then it makes sense to say they complained of chest pain. I think we're, you know, we're doing our assessment and treatment to rule out uh, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. You always want to take standard precautions. You want to have your gloves before you enter the scene. You want to maybe sometimes have to double glove. That way you can take off the dirty pair of gloves and you still have a clean pair of gloves, at least not soiled. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't eat with them, but at least they're not soiled with blood or whatever. And then wash your hands immediately. Uh, the number of patients. So we say, is the scene safe? I have BSI. Uh, what's the mechanism of injury? The next step now is how many patients do I have? And you want to do this very early on. If you see two cars in a crash, don't just assume it's two drivers. There may be five people in one, there may be three in another. Now you have you know, a t potential of eight patients um, that are going to far exceed what capacity your EMS can provide at that time. So we want to count those and report that back to dispatch very early on. We want to think about other resources. If you're going to a wreck, you know, ask dispatch, has law enforcement and fire been, adv been advised? If you're going to something that maybe uh, affects utilities, you know, has the utility company been, been notified? Uh, wreckers, um, putting air transport on standby. If it sounds bad, put them on standby. They don't have to launch yet, but think about those other resources. You don't want to be out on scene for 25 minutes and then say, oh, there's, we can't get this door open. We're going to need fire for extrication. Well, that's 25 minutes too late. You should have had them out in that first scene size up. So before you make patient contact, you're thinking about all of these steps. And they look like this, as far as paraphrases. I have BSI, body substance isolation. I have my gloves on, I have my goggles on if I need them, I have my mask if I need it, whatever. Is the scene safe? Is the scene safe for me to enter? The answer is no, I don't enter. If it becomes unsafe, I leave the scene and I try to take people with me. What's the mechanism of injury if it's trauma or if it's medical? What's the nature of illness? What was the call we're going to for? How many patients do I have? You may not know this initially. Dispatch may say two vehicles. You get on scene and you have a driver in one car and a driver and an occupant in the other. You have three. But you want to figure that out really quick. Do I need additional resources? So somebody that fell, maybe a near drowning, maybe they're still in the water. You know, think about these things before you um, arrive on scene. And if it's trauma, think right away about C-spine. Cervical spine immobilization or stabilization, you don't get a second shot with this. If you open the airway, head tilt, chin lift on somebody with a neck fracture or injury, spinal cord injury, then that's it. You know, they don't get a second chance. You don't get to do take two. So you want to think about this very early on. Your primary assessment then is your APU ABCs. And it starts with something we call the general impression. This is where you're trying to find out in the primary assessment if there's any life threats to the patient. So you walk in and you look at them and you say, how does my patient look? Isn't that cool? Just like something you say to yourself, not out loud, something you say to yourself to get that general impression. 
So you can note their gender and approximate age, um, whether or not the patient had trauma or a medical problem, and then something about their level of consciousness. Most people sitting in a chair, if you walk in, they'll turn and look at you. Okay, that's an awake patient versus somebody laying on the floor on their side and they're drooling and they don't look at you. They appear to be unresponsive. If that's the case, we want to check, assess the level of responsiveness. So if it's trauma, I'm going to say, partner holds his spine. If they look like they're unresponsive. If they look like they're responsive, I may say, ma'am, like this one, look at me, look forward, you know, if she fell or something, try not to move your head. And then, you know, introduce myself and have the patient, come, my partner, come around from behind and grab her neck or her head and keep it immobilized. Um, introduce yourself and then say something like, you know, hey, this is Susie with EMS. What seems to be the problem today? And they may introduce themselves, and you get a response. Either they're completely alert or awake. And we'll talk about the difference in those. But this is the ABPU scale, A-V-P-U. Maybe they appear to be unresponsive, but when you shout their name, they look at you. That's response to verbal stimuli. Maybe you have to pinch them or do a sternal rub, and they grimace or moan. That's a response to painful stimuli. And if you do all of these things and they don't move at all, that's completely unresponsive. So that's somebody who maybe has no oxygen flow to the, or very little oxygen flow to the brain, and the brain cannot be responsive. Maybe it's somebody who had trauma to their brain. Maybe it's somebody who's lost so much blood there's not enough oxygen in the brain. There's a lot of different causes for this, but this is a priority patient if they are unresponsive. In fact, if they have any deficits to verbal pain or are completely unresponsive, we call that altered mental status, and that's a priority patient. It's really good at that point to say, um, at any point that you see this, I have a priority patient. So we're going to do that. this ABCs. We're going to look at the airway. If you go up and say, hi, my, my name is Susie, I'm with EMS, what seems to be the problem today? And they say, oh, I, I hurt my leg, I think it's broken. Okay, well, number one, they're awake, their airway's good, they're breathing, and their heart's probably beating because I see nobody with um, who is breathing who is breathing without a pulse, if that makes sense. But I still want to check that pulse. So that's very good. I've done I've done my APU ABCs with somebody like that. Otherwise, if they're if they're unresponsive, I have to open the airway, and I'm going to do that with my head tilt, chin lift for medical patients, and my jaw thrust for trauma patients. I'm going to look in the mouth and see if I can see any foreign bodies or secretions. I'm going to listen. Do I hear gurgling respirations that I need to suction? Do I hear snoring respirations that I need to insert an airway adjunct? But I need to clear that airway first step. Then I'm going to listen to breathing. And um, again, I can open the airway and then I'm going to assess not only the rate but also the quality of breathing. Is it too shallow? Is it too deep? Is it labored? Is it normal? Is it too slow? Is it too fast? something about their breathing and um, if I have any problems in this area if they're breathing well but they're maybe a little cyanotic or altered mental status this is where I can put oxygen on them if they're not breathing well if it's irregular or slow or something that tells me they're not ventilating well then I can ventilate for them so I'll put in an airway adjunct and then one person at the head takes over airway that's their only job airway breathing then I'm going to check circulation. So if they're conscious, it's really nice just to kind of reach out your hand like you're going to shake theirs and grab their radial pulse like you learned in skills practice. Something about their radial pulse. And at the same time, you can check color, temperature, and condition of the skin. So that's really nice. If somebody's unconscious, though, I'm going to go right for the adult. Or I'm going to go on to the, car the carotid. For an infant, I'll check at the brachial. But I'm going to grab that carotid really quick. And I might even compare checking a carotid and comparing it with a radial because the carotid is a central pulse and the radial is a peripheral pulse and I can compare the two uh, on there and then kind of tell how the circulation is. Now if they have any problems with airway breathing circulations or their level of consciousness they're a priority patient especially one that I can't fix. Skin. What does it mean if it's pale? It means that it's kind of whitish, and it means that they don't have any blood or a very decreased amount of blood to that part of the body. If it's flush, very red, it may be excess circulation because they may have hypertension, they may have high blood pressure, they may have heat exposure, um, they may be, have been exposed to a chemical. Um, if it's blue, we think of it as being cyanotic. Now this is different from pale. Pale, they, don't, they have a decreased amount of blood in that area, 
whereas blue, they have enough blood, it's just lacking in oxygen. And we call that blue cyanosis. If it's yellow, then it's a liver problem. They call that jaundice. Or it can be a normal color for them. It's always good to have a family member in, that you can ask, hey, is this normal color for them? After the primary assessment, you have to make a decision. Is this what we call a load and go priority patient, or is this a stay and play delayed patient? And this is where you want to, if you're first responding, you want to update EMS responders and say, hey, I have a priority one patient uh, with shortness of breath and weak peripheral pulses. Uh, I have a priority patient with difficulty breathing and altered mental status. I have a delayed patient who has normal uh, assessment findings but complains of a, pain, a possible broken arm. So this is where you make that decision. You want to update EMS responding units give them some information. Again, we don't keep information, we provide information. And uh, make sure that all those steps are done um, in that primary assessment. Your primary assessment ne needs to go pretty quick. So here's how it looks. How does my patient look? And then, uh, and if, it's, if they're awake or verbal, you know, you can get some information from them. If, it's, if it looks like trauma, you would say, partner holds his spine. You walk up to him and say, sir, ma'am, are you okay? I'm Susie with EMS. What seems to be the problem today? You get a response. Maybe. Maybe they're completely awake and alert, and they look at you and talk to you. They get an A. If you have to shout at them to get that response, it's responsive to verbal. If you have to pinch them or prod them to get them to respond, moan or groan, then you say P, painful, or completely unresponsive. If they're awake, then we get the chief complaint, what seems to be the problem today, how is the airway? If needed, you're going to insert your oral pharyngeal airway, OPA, or your NPA, your nasal airway, if it's needed. How is the breathing? This is where we do our ABCs. And either they get oxygen or ventilation as needed. Check the pulse. Check C, circulation. How is the skin color, temperature, and condition along with that pulse? Look up and down the body for external bleeding. And some people will say, boy, this is crazy. You mean I've got to walk up to somebody and do all of this stuff and they're spurting blood out of their arm and I have to do my APU and my airway and my breathing before I can stop that bleeding. Well, it's like this. If you walk up to them and they're going, oh, my arm, I'm bleeding. Well, they're awake. I hear them breathing. Therefore, their, air must, their airway must be open and they have a pulse. So you check that stuff and as soon as you get to them, you can control the bleeding. And then eat. And then you make that decision based on what I see. My, I will advise DMS that the patient is priority or delayed. These are your paraphrases. If we learn them like this and break them up into scene size up in your primary assessment, it makes a lot of sense. So a priority patient is anyone with altered mental status or any airway, breathing, circulation problem that you cannot correct. If they're bleeding and you control that bleeding and they're pretty stable with that, they're not showing signs of shock, then you control that and you can, do, you can drop them down to a delayed um, priority. Secondary assessment. Secondary assessment starts with investigating that chief complaint. And so somebody who's conscious can an answer all these questions for you. If they're not conscious, then you can get a family member to get that history. And we want to talk to them about past medical conditions, uh, illnesses, Ill or any injuries that they have, any events that led up to it. How did you feel this morning? You know based on signs and symptoms that they tell you. So we're going to ask them questions in a systematic manner and that's why this sample works out so well. We try to ask questions that are open-ended like uh, instead of saying with somebody that has chest pain, well does it feel sharp? No. What well, does it feel like a stabbing pain? No. So there's two no. You don't really find out much about it whereas if you say can you describe the pain to me that's an open-ended question and they can give you a better uh, example of how that pain is. So learn the relevant facts of what matters and this is where the, that sample history comes in. Uh, and I think it's the next slide that's going to pop up. Ask one question at a time, good eye contact, if some, and I hate that word senile, pa patients unconscious or senile, if they have altered mental status for any reasons, if they have dementia or whatever, then ask a family member to help you and communicate that information onto somebody else. So S-A-M-P-L-E. S stands for signs and symptoms. This is where we get information as to what happened. Um, I fell, I hurt my arm. Where is the pain? Does it move anywhere? I compare that to one side to the other. 
And do you have any allergies? It may be to food, medications, anything. I want to know all the allergies. I'm going to write these down. Are you taking any medications? And also ask about over-the-counter medications, not only prescription. Uh, past pertinent medical history. So maybe somebody that has chest pain maybe had a myocardial infarction or a heart attack last year. That would be relevant information to ask. Uh, the last time they ate or drank anything, and we're going to communicate that on to the receiving team that uh, picks up the patient and then uh, the hospital that receives that patient as well. And then lastly, and here's what's kind of hard. So let me put this into like a scenario and then, then we'll take a break here and continue on with part two of this. So I walk in and a man's having chest pain. I've done my scene size up. I made sure his chihuahua was put up. I made sure, you know, the steps weren't broken at the front because I'm going to have to walk down there ca carrying his weight. I want to make sure that everything's stable. So I've done my scene size up. I've got my gloves on. He's my only patient. And it's a cardiac call I'm first responding on. And I walk in. He's sitting in a chair. It appears that he's awake. Uh, so my general impression is, you know, he, he's looking a little gray colored or pale colored, but he's awake at least. I introduce myself to him and he answers me that he's having chest pain. So I can see that um, he is awake, his airway's open, his breathing's not great, but it's not terrible. And I'll reach over and shake his hand and check that pulse. At the same time, I'll check skin color, temperature, and condition. Whew. Yeah, he's a priority patient because it has to do with a cardiac event circulation. So I advise the crew that he's awake and talking to me, um, ask them for an ETA, and tell them that he is having chest pain. At least they know somebody's there and the patient um, is, a, is alive at this point. And I'm going to start talking to him about his sample. So I'm going to ask him all these questions like, well, what time did the pain uh, begin? What does it feel like? Um, do you have any allergies? Do you have any medications? And his wife grabs up all the medications and puts them in a little bag for me so I can take him to the hospital with him. I'll ask about his pertinent past medical history. And he says, well, I had a heart attack last year and they had to put in some stents. Okay, um, were you in the hospital very long? Do you follow up with your doctor? Oh, you also have high blood pressure. Okay, do you control that very well? Information like that. Last time he ate or drank anything. And now I get down to E, events. And what am I supposed to do? Ask him, so can you tell me what led up to this? No, this is a good time. It's a great opportunity for me to take all that information and say, sir, so uh, about an hour ago you started having chest pain that felt like an elephant sitting on your chest. And uh, you took a nitroglycerin that you had, but you didn't have any relief. And on a scale of 1 to 10, it's probably 10 being the worst pain you've ever had. You, do, you uh, describe this pain as an 8. Uh, um, uh, you had a heart attack about a year ago and they put in some stents. You also have high blood pressure and you take medication for that, although your blood pressure has been running a little bit high. Uh, you don't have any allergies and you ate two hours ago, you had a sandwich. Is that correct, sir? And this is really great uh, for communication because number one, it tells them that you were listening. It gives them a chance to clarify anything that you misunderstood. That's what I like the E in the sample for. So this is a good time um, on here that we can pause this and 